So Pia just showed you all of the remarkable things and flavors and foods that microbes help us create. So let's now take a moment and think about how microbes multiply. It takes a lot of microbes to make many of the foods that she was telling you, so they better grow very fast. So before we go and talk about microbe growth, I want to just start and talk about something that might be a little more familiar to you, which is the multiplication of people. How is it that people multiply? So you all know how this happens. You start out with one person, and that person, of course, divides and makes two people. Um, the person who divided then dies, so you're left with two people. Those two people divide, making four people. The original two people die, the four people divide. You then have eight people. And in the next generation, you have 16 people, and then 32 people, and there's just proliferation of people. So mathematicians call this process, where one gives rise to two, which gives rise to four, and so on, exponential growth. And we can easily quantify this by writing down a formula for how many people um, there are after n generations, according to the model that I just gave you. The formula is this. The number of people n is equal to 2 to the little n, where little n is the number of generations. Now, this tells you the number of people in terms of the number of generations, and it reproduces the proliferation that I discussed a moment ago. So if we want to convert, instead of talking in terms of generations, we want to talk about time, then what we can do is say that every generation takes some amount of time. So for humans, I don't know, you might say it takes 20 years, you might say it takes 30 years. So that means that n, the number of generations, is the total time that's elapsed divided by 30 years. And we can then write the formula as capital N is equal to 2 to the t over tau, where tau is the generation time, and in this case, it is 30 years. So why is this called exponential growth? So the reason is, is because mathematicians like to write this formula instead of in the simple form that you see in front of you. We like to write that n of t, the number of people at times t, at time t is e to the k times t, where, where e is the exponential function, and k is, is what we call the exponential growth rate. k can be related um, to um, the, the previous formulas that I gave you. It's simply the log of 2 based e divided by tau, that is k. And this is simply a way to rewrite the formula, and it gives the name exponential growth. Now, if you were to actually go and look at a plot of the number of people that there were on the planet as a function of time, as I show here, then what you would see is a function that looks very much like the one that I just drew. The number of people started out very small, and over time it rose, and now there are lots and lots of people that are on the Earth. And of course, um, as you can see, if you look at this plot, um, the, the issue that it raises is, is that eventually you might worry that all of the people can't survive on the planet that they're in because they might get crowded or they might run out of food um, or something else. And indeed, you know, one of the most important questions in, in the study of sustainability of the Earth is basically how this process will proceed, namely how many people can the Earth support? Um, anyway, given the food resources there are. Now, this is a topic that brings us a, a bit afar from the topic of microbes and cooking in a certain sense, and I'd like to just recommend a book for you to read if any of you are interested in this. Um, there is a, a wonderful book, which actually is by the same title, How Many People Can the Earth Support?, that goes through in great detail how this exponential growth formula that I've shown you, um, combined with the resources that are available on planet Earth, um, lead to a bound of the number of people that we can have. Okay, so now why am I telling you this um, in the context of a cooking course? The reason, of course, is that the same issue occurs with microbes um, in cooking. So in fact, a microbe really does start out as a, single, um, as a single organism, like for example, here is a picture of a bacteria, and every generation the bacteria divides. So one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, and so on and so forth, until one has an exponential number of bacteria in a population. After 12 generations, we have 4,096 bacteria, whereas after 22 back generations, we have more than 4 million bacteria. So let's put in actual numbers to see how this works. So in order to do that, we have to take an example of a bacterium. So let's consider the bacterium Salmonella, which is relevant for cooking, um, because if there's too many Salmonella in the food you're eating, you will get sick. So it turns out that Salmonella has a division time under reasonable growth conditions of about 20 minutes. So this means that the number of salmonella that there will be um, after time t, if you start out with one salmonella on your piece of cheese that you are now eating, um, would be 2 to the t over tau, where tau is 20 minutes. How many salmonella will you have after 12 hours? Well, 12 hours is, let's see, so, so each hour corresponds to three generations, because each generation is 20 minutes. So 12 hours corresponds to, um, to 36 generations. So 
2 to the 36, it turns out, is the number 7 times 10 to the 10th. So there are 7 with 10 zeros after it, bacteria, on your piece of cheese. If you start with 1 um, on it right now, in 12 hours, there will be well, that many bacteria. Will you be able to see them? Well, every bacterium is actually very small. It turns out that every salmonella bacteria weighs about 10 to the minus 10 grams. It's one divided by one with 10 zeros after it grams. But if you wait 12 hours until you have seven times 10 to the 10 of them, then that means that you will actually have seven grams of bacteria on your cheese. Seven grams is enough that if we spread it out nicely, you'll be able to see it. And indeed, that's what happens when food spoils. So if you take your piece of cheese and you leave it on the counter without refrigeration for some period of time, you will notice that on top of it, you will get these wonderful films of bacteria or in other microbes. And these bacteria you can see because the generation time of the bugs is sufficiently short that if you let them sit for a while, you will end up with a visible number of bacteria. So there are many different types of bacteria that that exist on the earth, and there are many different types of bacteria and other microbes that are relevant for food, it turns out that 20 minutes is about the fastest division time that there is. And here's a table of the division times of several common um, bacteria and other microbes. So another particularly relevant division time for cooking is that of yeast, of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And that, it turns out, has a division time of about two hours. Um, um, for, so there will be far fewer yeast cells um, you know, in 12 hours than there would be um, you know, salmonella. Now, if we continue this further, then we are going to run into trouble. If we wait 24 hours, starting from our single salmonella, we will end up with of order 10 to the 21 salmonella bugs. If each of them has the mass, 10 to the minus 10 grams, that means we will have of order 10 to the 11 grams of bug. This number is absolutely crazy. So one ton is about 10 to the seven grams. So that means that this is about 10,000 tons. Now there's no way starting from a little piece of cheese, starting with one salmonella, even if you wait 24 hours, can you possibly produce you know, 10,000 tons of bacteria. And that is because mass is conserved. The bacteria have to eat. They're, of course, feasting on the cheese. And once there get to be too many, then they will run out of nutrients and they will stop dividing. So indeed, if you were to make a plot of the life cycle of bacteria growing on a piece of food or really anywhere, um, there is a characteristic shape to it. Initially, at early times, the bugs grow exponentially. Their number increases according to the laws that I've just described. Um, but eventually, they, um, this actually necessarily flattens out um, in what um, biologists call stationary phase. And this is when, essentially, the number of bugs is, is essentially constant um, because the, 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 the bacteria are crowding each other um, and interacting with each other. So the growth of bacteria, as I've been describing, is really very important for cooking. Um, as Pia told you, bacteria produce flavors that um, can be very special. They help produce products um, and catalyze chemical transformations that are very important, like the production of ethanol and um, whatnot. And so the, the way that bacteria grow um, is really critical in cooking protocols and many of the things that you will see this week, for example, from David Chang. So I've been talking about the time of bacterial growth, and that's clearly a very important parameter. And I told you that it was 20 minutes. But in fact, actually, the time for the bacteria to divide or of any microbe to divide depends on the conditions that they're in. Um, so the growth rate depends on the conditions. And the two most important conditions when one thinks about cooking situations are the temperature that the, the microbe finds itself in and also the pH of the environment. So if we were to plot the growth rate as a function of temperature, um, the growth rate tends to be positive over some range of temperature. So there's some minimum temperature above which the bacteria will grow, that the temperature has to be higher than a certain number for them to, to be able to divide, and the temperature has to be lower than another number um, for the bacteria to divide. And outside this temperature rate range, the bacteria won't divide anymore and actually will tend to die. They will tend to extinguish themselves. So this temperature range is really very important. The lower temperature range for bacterial growth um, is the reason that we put food in a refrigerator. It's because if we make the temperature cold enough, then um, bacteria won't be able to grow and, the, um, and microbes won't proliferate on our food. Similarly, when we, when we pasteurize or sterilize food to get rid of microbes, we have to make sure that the temperature is above the upper temperature. And so implicit in many of our recipes is this idea that you have to, um, if you would like to get rid of microbe growth, you have to be outside of these temperature windows. And if you would like to facilitate microbe growth because you are trying to actually take advantage of the chemical transformations that the microbes would use, you have to be within these bounds.
So the, the same goes with pH. So it turns out there's a range of pHs where microbes can grow. There's a lower value and there's an upper value. And in the same way that we decide, we learned that we could cook food by denaturing proteins, for example, by putting them in a, in a particular pH range, we also can manipulate the growth of microbes in this way as well. So what are these numbers? So let's just take as examples two of the microbes that you know tend to be important in cooking. So let's take E. coli um, and um, Saccharomyces cerevisia. So it turns out that E. coli grow in a temperature range which is roughly between 10 degrees Celsius and 40 degrees Celsius. The condition for maximum growth is very close to the, um, to the upper temperature threshold. It's about 37 degrees Celsius, which coincidentally or not, turns out to be um, very close to the temperature of our own bodies. So the other microbe, um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, is a yeast, um, which Pia has already um, talked to you about, and that tends to grow between a couple of degrees Celsius and um, 40 degrees um, Celsius. So in both cases, and in fact in the case of many microbes, if you'd like to eliminate growth, you need to get above 40 or maybe to play it say 50 degrees Celsius. If you do that, then microbes can't grow. And similarly, if you get below, well enough below 10 degrees Celsius, then they also can't um, grow. These facts are important to understand the protocols that are put forth for food safety. Now, there are really two different ways of actually eliminating microbes from food, which um, the first is called sterilization, which essentially means that you do something um, which is sufficiently severe that you get rid of, you kill all of the microbes in your food. Um, and the, a second idea is that of pasteurization, which basically means that you decrease the number of microbes substantially to put them below uh, some sort of safe threshold. So the definition of what a safe threshold is um, really depends on the different on the type of bacteria. And um, in the United States, the USDA has various standards of what a, a cook needs to accomplish in order for food to be declared to be safe. So for the microbe listeria, the standard says that you need to decrease whatever the heating procedure, the pasteurization procedure is that you use, needs to decrease the number of listeria by a factor of a million. For the case of salmonella, one has to decrease the number of bacteria by a factor of 10 million. Whereas for E. coli, the number has to be decreased by a order 100,000. So the way that the death of bugs works is very similar to the way that the growth of bugs work. Namely, you would imagine that every time, say every minute, um, depending on where you are, maybe half of the bacteria or microbes that you have will die. So after a minute, you have half as many as you, you had in the first place. And after another minute, you'll have half of that, which is a quarter. Waiting another minute, you'll have a half of that, which is an eighth. And then you have a sixteenth and so on and so forth. And so if the death time, as it were, were a minute, then, um, the, then basically what you do is you divide the number of bacteria you have by two to the n, where n is the number of one minute intervals that you waited, and that will basically tell you the way in which bacteria, the bacteria are dying off um, to help you understand whether or not you've met the USDA threshold. So the rule of thumb that the USDA uses for this, they call the 6.5 log 10 rule. And what that means is, is that you're supposed to wait long enough for the number of bugs to decrease by 10 to the minus 6.5. Now you'll notice the number 10 to the minus 6, well that's a factor of a million, that's listeria, and they basically recommend that you, you go a little bit below that just in case, and that's the typical rule of thumb that one has to obey when one is doing um, pasteurization procedures, and presumably that's to kill thing, you know, to kill the most, you know, um, if you don't know what kinds of bugs are in your food, you want to kill the ones that are the hardest to kill to make sure that you've got them all. Now, if we set 10 to the minus 6.5 equals 2 to the minus n, then it turns out that, um, that n, the number of generations you have to wait to get this factor, is about 22. So the rule of thumb is that you need to wait for about 22 generations of bacterial death in order for it to be fully pasteurized. Now the death rate, like the growth rate, is temperature dependent, and so therefore how long this means you have to wait in order for, until the food is safe to eat really depends on, a, on what the tau is, what the characteristic time for the bacteria to die is, and that depends on the situation. So just as example, let me show you a table from the National Dairy Can Council of the pasteurization times that you need to apply for milk. So if you do what is called vat pasteurization and heat your milk up to 63 degrees Celsius, you have to wait about 30 minutes. On the other hand, if you do what is called high temperature short time pasteurization, you can get away with pasteurizing for only a second if you heat it up to about 89, 90 degrees Celsius. If you go up to 94 degrees Celsius, you only have to, to go for a tenth of a second.
And then there is this idea called ultra-pasteurization, where you heat it up to 138 degrees Celsius, and you wait for two seconds, long enough to make sure that everything is really killed. Now, one thing you should think when you look at this table is that we've already told you what happens in this class if you take milk and you heat it up. We've told you that proteins tend to unfold at about 64 degrees or so, and so you can see that if you were to actually heat something above 64 degrees and heat it long enough for the proteins to unfold, you would start to actually cause phase transformations in the milk. So you can see that it's important that when you undergo the pasteurization procedure, you don't let this, to hap you don't let this happen. Similarly, I'll bet you if you go and look at ultra-pasteurized milk in the grocery store, you will see it has a slight brown color. The reason that it has a brown color is because, of course, if you're heating at 138 degrees, you're starting to initiate browning reactions, and you will see those within the milk. Finally, let me show you an equivalent set of data for meat, for, for actually you know, getting rid of microbes in meat. So here is a chart that actually comes from Dave Arnold um, and from his blog on cooking issues. So what it shows is that the, the, it plots temperature on the vertical axis as a function of time on the horizontal axis. And so at every temperature, it tells you how long you have to cook something for it to become safe. The green regions on this plot are places where you're totally good. If you put your food there, then you won't have a problem. And so you see um, at the bottom of the curve that is below about below about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, or a little above zero degrees Celsius, um, microbes, that is, it's actually safe to store meat without having microbes proliferate in them. And this, um, presumably many of you know, and that's the reason that we can store meat safely by putting it in a freezer. There then is a large red zone. This is a temperature range where there is not a time that you can leave it to basically get rid of the microbes. This is where the region in which the microbes actually like to grow. And finally, at very high temperatures, there's another green zone. If you take your meat, if you take your meat and store it above 75 degrees Celsius, then basically the mi microbes won't grow there, and so you'll be okay. On the other hand, what you also know is the meat will cook, which um, and it will even overcook, um, and so that you can't do either. So the question then is, how can you actually take a piece of meat which might have microbes in it and make it safe to eat? And that is the role of the yellow zone. Within this yellow zone, there exists some temperature where as long as you wait long enough, the um, meat will be safe to eat. Notice on this plot, there are two different curves. There's a curve that corresponds to poultry, and there's a curve that corresponds to beef. It turns out you have to cook poultry slightly longer to make it safe than beef. And so, for example, for poultry, um, if you cook it at 60 degrees Celsius, you have to wait about 30 minutes for it to be safe, according to this standard, whereas it only it takes beef more like five to seven minutes to be safe. Now, you might ask, why do you have to cook poultry longer than beef? This, of course, is a question of which environment is the growth rate larger. And although it's hard to say for sure what microbes like and don't like, there's one observation that we can make here, which I think is interesting to think about, which is that it turns out that the water content of beef is, is slightly less than that of poultry. Um, poultry tends to be in the high 60s to 70% water, whereas beef tends to be the low 60s um, percent water. And one reason you might think that that might be good for microbes is that if there's more, is that the microbes, of course, want to be surrounded by water. Um, and if there's more space for them, then they will be able to grow more easily. There's more microbes you can sort of fit in, actually, until the meat is completely rancid.